they each really work very differently. Sometimes it's a, you know, sometimes it's just something I turn somebody on to. Sometimes it's coming from a totally different place that I don't even know about. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's a group of students who decide to transcribe something and they get very excited mm -hmm. about that. We're mm -hmm. doing now, we've got a group working on um, Ed Sanders uh, delivered the Charles Olson Memorial Lecture at the University of Buffalo, which was a series of lectures instituted by Robert Creeley in the 80s. And Ed's lecture is kind of extraordinary because it's hard to figure out, like the notes for the lectures are in like in a 250 page three ring binder. And then the lectures are audio, but it's hard to know are the lectures, are the audio lectures the notes to the notes? Or are the notes the lectures that are not delivered? And so we're trying to figure out visually and audio-wise how we might present such a thing, you know, wh whether... That sounds wh like whether, digital humanities <laughs> to me. <laughs> well, um, and uh, interesting enough, there's a lot of ancillary material in there, and some of that material has to do with... Uh, he was thinking a lot of... It's, it's again, it's, to get to this idea of... Uh, he was thinking, he, he was looking, this is in the 80s, and he was looking at a lot of uh, research on neurology and the processing of language and of color. Mm. And then he went into a whole thing about the toxicity of paints, mm. okay? And of course, as we know, somebody like Jay DeFeo, who painted the rose, basically died from the toxicity of the paint that she was working with. Um, and uh, so it's got all these multiple layers and, you know, Figuring out a mode of representation is very interesting. We've got a Pedro Pietri project going on now, which is uh, Pedro was a New Yorkian poet or is de categorized as such. In the a during the AIDS crisis, he 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 wrote uh, what he called the condom poems, and basically he had these big Manila envelopes with filled with condoms that he would hand out to people or sell on the street and they would be accompanied by poems mm -hmm. and um, so we want to create a manila envelope with a with a range of materials from that period of his as facsimiles but it's very tricky we don't want to do like exact facsimiles you want right. you know something else to happen there like like we did with the Lorreen Niedeker project uh, which is a reproduction of her notebook, but it isn't an exact facsimile. It's a, it's a transference of something. Um, and, and so those are very interesting visual questions and, and you know, because the, the object is very important to us. You know, as you can see, we have not gone digital. Right. And uh, the actual object is very important to us, that it's a object that you can pick up and, uh, you know, we're, we're in the process of, th we're, we're doing a, we've got so a project. So the materiality of it is central. It's very important, yeah. But we are working now on a project uh, with a platform um, that would be an interactive, annotated possibility for teaching materials. And we're going to start with some of the teaching material projects the, the, mm. that we've done and see how those work in classrooms where people actually can, you know, work on them and use those exercises, comment on them, and uh, so we're going to see how that goes. one day can we take Audrey Lorde's classes? Yeah, yeah. Was, in some <laughs> sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, use her syllabi and, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so <clears throat> you are mentioning a few projects that you have going on. So how do you guys find the next project? Is it always... Do people come to you now? Or? Oh yeah, people come. Yeah, people right. come. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to like, or like, how do you how do you decide like, which well, ones to do? Or you know, they kind of they kind of um, at a certain point in the process, they kind of fit. Like the next series are all going to be pairs. So mm -hmm. we have um, Diane de Prima and Shelley. We have Julio Cortázar and Keats. We have Mira Rukeyser and Rimbaud. We found some translations of Rimbaud that she did. Um, which were discovered because they were quoted by Eisenstein, you know, in an essay. Wow. Yeah. And so then <laughs> okay. we looked and we found. Um, and then the last one is an absolutely extraordinary project. I don't know if anybody uh, recalls or has heard of a poet who then, at that time, was a nun, Sister Mary Norbert Corti. 
Yeah. Well, since now Mary Cordy lives in Northern California. She was uh, she's an extraordinary poet who was a who was a who was a nun for many years. And in 1965, she went to the Berkeley. She snuck out of the convent and went to the Berkeley Poetry Conference, and realized that that was her church. And um, there's a wonderful exchange. If you know Jack Spicer's lecture on poetry and politics, there's a wonderful exchange between her and Spicer where she asks him, well, he's saying that there's no, you can't have political poetry, and if you're going to do politics, you should, like, blow up a building and not, you know, not, not. And she says, well, what about the lyrics of Joe Hill? And Spicer starts singing a Joe Hill song. And then at his reading the next day, he says, where is that nun? She was the best thing that happened to this place. And uh, his last letter is to her. Anyways, to cut to the chase, I was in Vancouver, and I was looking at Michael McClure's archive. Um, and I was particularly looking at his correspondence, which is extraordinary, particularly. Is, did he keep everything? The, yeah, he's good. it's very extensive. He's got a really good, yeah. But the really interesting correspondence was with two good friends of his, Bruce Connor and Wallace Berman, were extraordinarily interesting arc, uh, about, particularly about the handling of materials and photography and all kinds of things. Anyway, so I'm going through this, and I discover a copy of Ghost Tantras, <laughs> which is sent to him by Mary from the convent. And she has response poems on each page of Ghost Tantras. And they're just, they're like, they're unbelievable. They're like Hildegard of Bingen or something. They're unbelievable. Wow. And so I, through the late Joanne Kiger, I found mm -hmm. Mary, who I'd always wanted to do a project on. And uh, I wrote her a long fan letter, and I tried the phone, didn't work. And I said, just call me. She called me. And we were on the phone for like two hours. Mm -hmm. And... Two of my students got totally lit up by this. They rented a pickup truck. They went to see her. She lives in the backwoods of Northern California. She's still like an environmental activist in her 80s. And she had never seen this again, this thing. You know, she had sent her copy to McClure, and that was the end of it. You know, she, she remembered some of the poems. But so anyways, we're going to publish that in an interview with her. That's great. Um, yeah. So sometimes a year, it's almost like passion projects from you or from someone on the team. Yeah, and there's also certain things that we feel ought to be done. Like there's a big backlog. Of, there were several people who had been working on David Meltzer, and then David died, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a kind of a bunch of things where we'd like to do something for David. Um, <coughs> there's a lot. There's a couple of Amiri Baraka projects that were started long ago that I, I would love to do. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, again, massive correspondence, Amiri's correspondence. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm kind of flabbergasted that nobody has, except for the book that we did, the Doran Baraka letters, that there hasn't been another many volumes of, of correspondence because he was a very good oh, correspondent. Yeah. I remember when I, was, when I was a grad student at Columbia and I was working as an archivist there, um, we were doing the Hetty Jones papers, right. his wife, and yeah. then... There was one request for him, for Amir Baraka to come speak, and his only reply was like a huge dollar sign on it and then a question mark. <laughs> Sent it back. <laughs> it's just like, not even a word, you know, I still that. Um, I just got a project that I'm looking at, which is the um, letters between, which is, again, it's very interesting when letters stop, you know, and when people mm -hmm. move closer together or when stuff becomes mm -hmm. digital. Um, a very nice correspondence between Bernadette Mayer and her sister, and her sister Rosemary, uh, who was a visual artist, and uh, it was at a time when they were not living in proximity, and you know, it, uh, the people were still writing letters. And that's when these, yeah, that's when exactly. If you're yeah. if you're living next to the person or with, right. them, then there's stop. no archival yeah. trace. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in relation to that, so when you said when letters stop, like, what do you think? What do you see right now as some of the biggest challenges? You also, you know, when we sat down, you talked about these are going to be destroyed. You know, you talked right. about that too in, in a little history about mm -hmm. all of these destroyed archives. Like, what do you see as the current big challenges and what what are the steps that you are taking or that the project represents in relation to that? You know, uh, again, I'll go back to that thing I mentioned at the beginning, follow the person. That, that was one of our, our like... In classes, I often bring in a stack of magazines, for instance, and uh, people open, I don't know, Yugen, and they say, 
look at the table of contents. Barbara Guest, Amiri Barak, Frank O'Hara. Like they, they can't figure out why are these people in the same magazine. I said, well, <laughs> yeah. because they knew each other, you know. And so I said, don't you know? Forget about uh, pe pe people. You know, people are trained on anthologies and on, you know, labels, schools. Like you know, like we're talking about fish here, and um, <laughs> you know, and and that's not how things went. You know, it's like there's a little there's a little note from Jack Kerouac to. 1957, okay, you'd think this is pretty late in the game. Tremendous excitement that he's met this guy named John Wieners, who just came from Black Mountain College, who's starting a new magazine called Measure, and he's taken two of Kerouac's poems. I mean, like, it just puts things in a very different perspective, you know, of, of how, you know, purported levels of fame and notoriety and et cetera, and how actually people knew each other or what their relationship to each other was. Um, and that certainly goes for, you know, I'm very interested in exploring. We've got some stuff going on. Doing this Cecil Taylor thing was a, a, a step in that direction. But I'm, I'm trying to get somebody. Part of it is also finding the right student who will be interested in a certain thing. Right. Like, I'm really interested in the NYPL just bought Sonny Rollins' archive, and um, his, his, uh, his journals look really interesting. His journals look really interesting. Uh, also, Amiri had worked with Max Roach on a biography, on an autobiography that's in the Library of Congress in Max's archive. Mm -hmm. It's endless. So anyway, so, so get back go, to your you question. You repositories and you Well, you say, find out about something? things, you know, you find out about things and you, but it was to, to follow the person, okay, what I'm trying to do with this is to um, just weave a web, mm. you know, that, that, that can be there for the record, you know, which disrupts right. the, the uh, which disrupts the Received notions the of how they, the, the way category, we, the way yeah, we end up yeah, to teach sometimes. exactly, yeah. and and so just that I think is I feel is a is a is is something right, you know? like so, and, when and training people who are going to continue doing this kind of work, mm -hmm. you know, that that's very exciting, and I'm yeah, seeing there's not many opportunities know, to do this kind of work, right. which is very essential and to, to the legitimate survival. and to legitimate this kind of work in a in an academic setting where this right. is like considered important work and not just like a sideline, you know, um, right? Because my, my my sense is that the skill set that it takes to do one of these projects is is higher than most dissertations, and I've. Mm -hmm. I've been a, I've done about 50 or 60 dissertations so I'm, I know what I'm talking about <laughs> right <laughs> well that's the thing I mean I, I was one of the questions I was trying to formulate you know for this I was, was something I, you I, you keep encountering sometimes especially outside of academic settings is this notion that like well if it was any good it would be published already right or <laughs> right. something like, like why did it stay in the shadows <laughs> this kind of a mindset right like, what's the value of all this right and then, like, what are you getting this? Uh, is this you trying to make like a side hustle of money or something? <laughs> and uh, but I think this answers some of that. And but it's it, it's like you said, how to make it academically and also culturally sanctioned is more difficult, you know, in certain yeah. settings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just to answer one of your previous questions, yeah. I thought of a, an example. Um, the, one of our earliest projects was the Frank O'Hara Kenneth Koch letters. Hmm. And um, Karen Koch, uh, Kenneth's widow, was overjoyed because she said, "I this is I, I never knew, really? you know, because she was a you know she, she came into his life later." She said, "I didn't I didn't know this, and this is like a whole new, you know." Yeah, and, uh, and sometimes also like you know in, in doing research, this can happen not just with a project like this, but in doing research, like one of the most marvelous things for me was when. Uh, Brent Edwards and I were trying to authenticate the Claude McKay novel, you know, prove beyond shadow that it was by Claude McKay. We ended up contacting so many people, including um, a lady named Mary Britton, whose mother, Betty Britton, had known McKay later in the late 40s in Chicago, when he had, uh -huh. in the last phase of his life. She had no idea about this relationship, and in her attic, she found like 25 letters by Claude McKay Whoa. to uh, her mother. You know, wow. uh, <laughs> so it's just, and but I love that. Also, I, I kind of love that I couldn't use any of them in the authentication, in the sense that it's not about use, right? In this kind of um, 
uh, you know, practical kind of a way, but it's a way of enriching our understanding of, of a phase of his life where that we know almost yeah. nothing about. And, um, you know, I'm always telling her, you know, just one day, just give, give, uh, give them to the Schoenberg or something like that. This um, is like with the Helene Johnson project that we did. Helene Johnson, who was a, a you know, a cause celebre in the ha Harlem Renaissance as a young, young poet, uh, was lost track of, and this manuscript appeared uh, through um, friends who run the Allen Ginsberg uh, archive, and mm -hmm. the Helene Johnson's daughter used to work at Max's Kansas City, and she knew Allen, and she was always trying to, you know, sh she had given him this manuscript to see what she could do with it, and he had sent it around. Anyways, the manuscript came back, and here are all these poems by this woman who had, who had, moved to the village and continued writing poems, you know, yeah. throughout her life. Mm -hmm. And so we did these late, these extraordinary late poems by her that were just totally unknown. So, um, in order, so for students who want to know what you guys have, how are they accessible, like these lost and found? Let's say, you know, I'm working on Langston Hughes. I, I didn't, I had no idea that he had this trip that, right. uh, how would I, are they searchable? Is it, do you go to the website? Are they marked records on libraries or? Well, I mean, there are the, that's a very good question. I mean, there are the books, you know, yeah. in, in this case, uh, there are the books and, um, because that visibility is always a problem, right? Yeah. So, but I'll you tell you one. Them out of the archive. Yeah, but I'll tell but you. Nobody I'll, knows you did it. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you though. Uh, in terms of, uh, in relationship to either academic or small press publishing, our sales are robust. Nice. I will say, you know, I mean, we sell probably anywhere between mm, a thousand and twenty-five hundred copies of of each wow. series, you know, and. Uh, our printer is in the building, so mm. <laughs> you know we don't have to store things. Um, so we run out and we get another order, you know, and we print them. Uh, <laughs> so we just have to buy the. I mean, we have to pay for the printer, but we have to buy the paper is stored, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's so it's a very good arrangement, you know. It's a very it's a very unusual arrangement. Yeah, great. Well, are there maybe, some, maybe some questions? Yeah, sure. Our, yeah. Audience, yeah. Yeah, and then run. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciated your talk. Sure, yeah. thanks. I'm like really loud <laughs> on this. <laughs> Can you turn it down a little? Okay, is this okay? Yeah, it's okay. fine. Um, so actually, um, some of the things that you were saying brought back some of the memories um, that I had of interest in poetry when I was much younger. Uh -huh. um, in fact, it's funny because you brought up the Amiri Baraka reader, right? Um, I have I have a copy of that from like 16 years ago from freshman year at Yale. Uh -huh. It was taught on uh, formation of modern American culture. Mm -hmm. And actually, what was interesting to me is when I saw Amiri Baraka at Yale, um, my impression, and I ha I had the reader, and I was I was interested by his work. But uh, when I uh, saw him at Yale, I remember thinking, wow, he really hates white people, <laughs> right, in his poetry. Um, and I can understand that anger now as, a, you know, as, an, as, I, as I've aged and, and matured. But what I wanted to actually bring up um, is um, my own history um, is that, you know, my family, and also the Lang, actually I wanna bring up one more thing, the Langston Hughes thing was very interesting to me right. because I was actually drawn to Langston Hughes uh, a lot, as many people are, but like very drawn to uh, his poetry when I was at Yale um, because, I don't know, something really drew, drew you know, and, and I'm, I'm like the Central Asia connection now because it's like my family, like I, my family's immigrants from Bangladesh, mm -hmm. but we have lineage that tra you know, traces back to Central Asia, you know? Right. And so it, it's like, I feel like some of these, these things, they're pieces that are coming back, mm -hmm. you know, for myself. Um, I am first generation born a Bangladeshi American, and I have a sadness in myself because I actually do not know how to understand Bangladeshi poetry, right? It's a completely different, um, you know, um, it's a completely different dialect than right. colloquial uh, Bangla. 
And um, so, like, for me, it's like, I mean, yeah, I can understand, you know, Robin Tagore is a famous guy, right? Um, and then I recently um, met um, someone, a local poet, Alam Gear, um, in the, uh, in that, just outside of the Philadelphia area. But there's a sadness in me, actually, that even though I can speak Bangla, um, I can't really understand a lot of the poetry. And right. I, I kind of want to, but it's like, that would take a lot of study, right? Like yeah. extra study. And part of the reason, you know, that makes me super sad is because, you know, the language was lost. Mm -hmm. um, the whole reason, you know, like there was a whole genocide that happened against the Bangladeshi people was part of like, Bangladesh wanted to preserve their language. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's like this huge loss about um, Bangla and Bangla culture and poetry that I experienced as a first generation born um, U.S. Bangladeshi. And then well, also my sister, you know, she's one way like, to One yeah. way to do something about yeah. that would be to immerse yourself in it. Right, but it's, know? it's like, it's, 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 it's like a whole, yeah, kind of yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, that's, yeah, I mean. And you guys could archive some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ron, did you, did yeah. I, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I bet everybody in this room has their own pet projects. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, wanna, yeah. You know, and I want to ask you about the well, Spicer uh, Circle. Uh, in those exact same terms, because I, when I was a kid in San Francisco State in the 60s, Robert Duncan was very clear and probably a little more clear than he deserved to be, saying that he had been the person who had decided who was in and who was not in the new American poetry. And all this stuff you were talking about, schools and anthologies, mm -hmm. I think is exactly right on. But one of the things that's clearly not there is any evidence at all of the Spicer Circle. Jack is in there, and in a completely different section, John Wieners is in there, but Joanne Kiger, Ronnie Primack, James Alexander, mm -hmm. Joe Dunn, Harold Dole, none of those people, George Stanley, oh, he's a little later, mm -hmm. Larry Fagan, for that matter, none of those people are there. And now we're down to a part, to a point where I think only Harold and George are even still alive from that that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, I think it was <laughs> central to that whole period and that place. But its absence is what allows people to talk about fictions like the San Francisco Renaissance, mm -hmm. which is a construct sort of built over its absence. You, you know, you can, you can pick almost any time or place yeah. and find the same problem. You know, so, you know, part of the part of the thing here is just thickening the soup, you know, and and just um, showing again, you know, that any of these people that one looks at, there's a very dense nexus of other people involved, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for that sure. great presentation. Um, I was interested in you were talking about your commitment to um, producing um, physical objects um, as part of your work. And I was curious about if you've had to deal with the digital as being source material for those printed objects, which is to say like- Born as digital stuff? Born, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So as right. archives are taking in things like yeah. copy disks and so forth, is that something you've had to grapple with yet? Not yet, no. And. Uh, it's probably going to be the cut. I don't know. We'll see. It might be the cutoff point. Um, I'm going to retire. Yeah. <laughs> um, it might be the cutoff point. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. No, we haven't. We haven't. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks sure. for a fascinating presentation. Um, you talked a lot about uh, reconstructing the social and artistic context of these figures. And I'm wondering if. Um, that has the potential not only to enhance our understanding of their work and the way in which they uh, produce, but of radically disrupting received critical understandings of established figures. Has oh, that ever happened and how? Thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. Hmm. 
I mean, can I give one example? Yeah, cool. uh, yeah sure. So just for my, I'm teaching a, a seminar on Kerouac and counter, post-war counterculture right now, and one of the things they had to read for today was a Ted Jones piece where he meets Kerouac and they go to a jazz club together. And many of the comments that the students are saying already is how it's just changing their whole understanding of how they were interacting, how musicians were interacting, black and white poets were interacting, talking with each other, collaborating with each other in ways that often that gets lost uh, as the ossified kind mm -hmm. of myths or stereotypes get latched onto certain uh, literary figures and just one short it's like what four or five pages yeah, yeah, yeah. one f uh, a short story like that really debunks a lot of this uh, misrepresentation that's been happening that's a that's a tiny example but I think you can that you can take something like that and extend it into a whole re uh, contextualization of a whole yep. poetic literary scene yeah I would say also um, just off the top of my head I'm just looking at the catalog here um, some of the stuff that we've done uh, of Diane de Primas, I think, is very important because mm -hmm. uh, um, we've done one of her Olson lectures and uh, something on HD and then something on Robert Duncan. And there's, uh, we're doing this Shelley thing. And I think there, there are probably easily five or six volumes of, of poetics work that could be drawn from Diane's work. And were that to be available, I think it would completely change the vocabulary of how people are thinking about poetics in this period. Because she has a different terminology, a different approach, different focus. Um, and it's, it, I think it would just be a very, very uh, um, useful intervention in how people are thinking about things. And there isn't quite enough of it that we've done, but we're you know we're working on it. And the idea would be to collect a bunch of things, uh, you know that 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 would that would be enough to s where people would say, oh, okay, yeah, this yeah. has to be taken into account. Now. And then the, the scholars have to go in there and think yeah. through it. I mean, always that delay, I mean, what JC know? did with the French Kerouac is is mind blowing. I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing. It just totally changes the picture. I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing. Thanks, but also like to, the idea of archives too is like delay is built into that, right? Like it's always going to happen usually after death and uh, most cases, most yeah. cases. Yeah. and then it takes a long time for it to trickle into the scholarly community, and then right. the, those books have to come out. So you know the, the time it, it's very long. Delay is like this integral part of it. It's almost like a synonym for archive delay, yeah. you know. And yeah. so, um, <laughs> and it, it, but uh, but it's there. So, and then these become pr like precious primary sources that are more publicly disseminated than in that one repository that the person right. has to go to. Right. And it, so this dissemination can happen faster. It's like a speed up process. We did the we did a project of selected letters of Michael Rumaker. Michael Rumaker was a writer who attended Black Mountain College. He was from Philly, actually, and. Um, that really was helpful in spurring on a whole new interest in Rumaker, who was a very under, under acknowledged, pioneering, queer writer who uh, is just extraordinary. And there were five or six books that came out after that. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, part of the impetus of these kinds of projects is to push, you know, <coughs> needle like, okay, here's a, a bit of this, but. Somebody else could go on and do more of this work. We have a, you know, Allison who, who led us to the work of Hilda Morley, uh, who was a Black Mountain student, and we have a whole team now that's been working on that. And what happens a lot of times is that the the, the materials get to an archive and they remain unprocessed because they don't have budgets to process the materials. So, you know, if you can find a student who could be an intern and help process the material to make a finding, you know, to to start getting the, the basis of a finding aid, then the stuff can start to be used. And that is part, that's, that's also part of the problem. There's so much stuff that's just sitting there, you know. Yeah, um, yeah Rachel. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for your oh, work. Uh, I'm from 88 on FWPV Philadelphia. Yeah, hi. Do you have any curators that come on the radio and do a specific topic as a lecture online? <sighs> you know, I'm dying to do something like that, you know. Well, you can do it on WPEV. Okay, well, <laughs> nice. we'll, I'll talk, I'll, we'll do it. 
I'll, I'll talk, yeah, let's talk about it. Okay. Awesome, great. That'll be the final Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so you started in the 50s and 60s, and then you've done some stuff into the, the 80s. And, and that's why I don't want to be one of those people that, like, suggests someone. But yeah. I'm just, I'm just thinking, so I'm thinking, like, when I gave my archives, like, I had to, like, just the absurdity of changing to the digital world. Like, I, you know, I had to, they asked me to print out my emails. And, right. Like, I just, it was... Like, I don't know. Yeah. Just, there's something they know how to deal with paper. Yeah. yeah. Like in a, yeah, and the more paper, right? The more feet, the mm -hmm. more. Well, in Canada, it's actually you just get a tax credit that, that you have to pay capital gains on. That was like so. <laughs> I'm I'm considering actually never burning my own archives like, <laughs> going forward because uh -huh. it, like it, 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 they're just sitting there not being used. Anyway, that's not my question. So, um, <laughs> but I'm just thinking of you know into the '90s. So now I'm thinking about into the '90s and. Um, I'm just thinking of someone like Akila Oliver, whom I, like, I feel passionate about her work <laughs> being um, disseminated to, for lack of a better word. Um, and um, we actually had been, been talking thinking, about we, it? We, well, we had been thinking of doing something, but there was a, there was a deadlock in yeah, terms I know, of there's the, a, yeah, yeah and that, so and we it couldn't. makes me think of um, things about the family too, and like what, right. what is defined as family, and what is, what is queer kinship, and like, yeah. what, you know, and, um, so I'm glad you have been thinking of it because I was thinking of like, like now, like your imprimatur has like a, you know, authority to it, and and like maybe that would help. And um, yeah, in some cases that has helped. In some cases, yeah, it's complicated. But no, I, it, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because you know, right after she died, it was very much on our mind, and and but then there was like no, you know, we couldn't do anything. But, um, yeah, like she's got a, a master's thesis that, and I'm sure she was starting work on her PhD and mm -hmm. and the lovely work you did with the with the yeah with the syllabi with um, Lord and mm -hmm. stuff like that, like it's just I don't know she's just just yeah 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 no absolutely yeah so much yeah. with all the other yeah. people that yeah you're thinking, so. yeah there's uh, yeah no absolutely absolutely in in many cases it really involves like you know turning somebody on to this person and that mm -hmm. person just really then because I can't do all this work yeah, you no, know I'm so it's like, no so it's no I, but that's the process it's like you know being a kind of filter and say oh have you or having somebody come to us like you or Allison and saying have you thought of this or have you thought of that and and then often it may be a couple of years and all of a sudden a student shows up and I go ah that student is really going to go for this you know yeah, and there's this I like like so speaking digitally like it's like all caught it's all trapped in her computer and like and like and we don't write letters our generation doesn't write letters and so um like what how do and seriously i think people are seriously don't even consider it's like a different generation like they don't yeah. consider holding on to these the reason right. i even donated my papers because i was moving like right. across the border yeah. it's like i can't carry the shit with me so here it is it's going to go sit in sfu or whatever mm -hmm. like and no one's ever going to look at it. Like I well, don't think they're going to look at it in thirty delay. years. There's gonna no, be I, delay. No, but I know a delay. Believe me. Long <laughs> delay. <laughs> anyway, but things things do happen. You know, I mean, they're yeah. I, I did my different generation. I, did my, I think I, I did my archives in '88, and there have been three. Yeah, but books. you're from a generation that's been taken up, and people write you know, books about you and some of that, but, <laughs> but people aren't going to write books about There's stuff in the back, too. Yeah, unless someone, that, someone has to make no an way. extra, extra, no yeah, way. I just, I just think things are shifting with the, with the, like, with the digital age, with the digital natives, and, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm taking photographs of a conversation Ray Armancroft and I are having in the, in the comment section of Words with Friends. It's the only way to preserve it. You can't print it out. You can't, you know. So I'm you taking screenshots? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. That'll be a nice chapter. All right, so there, there's some uh, lost and found books for sale in the back, so. Yeah, many. Thank you to Emil Akalai for coming